Part 2 continued from Tenotosaurus episode. It had been two days since the relative peace had been established around the waterhole. The Tenotosaurus had continued to arrive to drink and feed, and while some had left, most stuck around to make use of the local resources while they were still available. A small number of Sauropelta had also arrived, but mostly kept to themselves. Being so heavily armoured and moving together, they had nothing to fear. Even the Dionychus behaved themselves, keeping fed by hunting small mammals or lizards, and even trying to pluck the flies out of the air that buzzed and irritated everyone. All species made regular stops to the waterhole. It was hot and predator and prey felt the need to keep topped up even though dinosaurs were well adapted to conserving water. Only one resident was missing from the scene, the area's top predator. Acrocanthosaurus. The large male had left to patrol his territory's borders. He would have much preferred to sleep under some shade, but instinct pushed him on. After scanning the north of his territory, he was on his way back to the waterhole to drink, before going to the next section. As he approached, he could hear the herds of Tenotosaurus off in the distance. The idea of hunting one was always in his mind, however he didn't need to quite yet. His back was elevated with high vertebra. These not only held large muscles, but a section of fat that had built up during the wet season. He still had to eat semi-regularly. The fat stored could not sustain an animal of his size for the entire dry season. But as long as he was moderate and hunted successfully from time to time, he could easily survive till the wet season. Now in the thicker foliage, the massive predator came to where he thought would be a small creek but it was dry. This was no surprise, as it was common at this time of year. But as he followed the empty creek, there was still no water to be found. Soon he had completely dry banks to his sides, but no water. He makes the final turn where there should have been the water hole. But instead, he finds a large ditch that contains a mass of mud and hundreds of footprints. The other species that had come to this waterhole had nearly drunk it dry, leaving a collection of stagnant pools and churned up mud. At the centre, where some surface water still remained in a decent amount, stand four Sauropelta, greedily gulping down as much water as they can. This was the first time the Acrocanthosaurus had seen this happen. The entire waterhole reduced to a humid mire. Though there was still water, the Sauropelta were standing over it, and as the male approached, the herbivores took up a defensive position, standing shoulder to shoulder and swinging their tails in readiness. He wouldn't get any form of a good drink here, and there is precious little to drink elsewhere. The carnivore began to feel a great frustration begin to rise within him, which quickly boiled over to anger. Something had to pay for this, and he didn't care who it was. Not far away, a female Tenotosaurus is waking up from her brief slumber. She scans the area and sees that most of the herd is resting as well, and the young play by the edges of the forest. She also sees the pack of Dionychus making their way towards what remains of the waterhole. Everything seemed to still be peaceful, and the sentries were still alert. She was about to go back to sleep when a series of shrill calls came from the waterhole's direction. As she turned to face the noise, the pack of Dionychus were now running full pelt in the herd's direction, suddenly appearing terrified. She was about to give a warning call when she felt something else through the ground. Footsteps. Very large footsteps. And they were in a hurry. The herd was now waking up from both the footsteps that were getting closer and the multiple Dionychus that were now running between them but not attacking. Then it all became clear as a massive Acrocanthosaurus rounded the corner at top speed, feet covered in mud. It saw the frightened faces of the herbivores and let out a blood-curdling roar. Those that were still asleep were awoken with a shock, and soon the entire herd was trying to get up and flee. The giant carnivore aimed for the startled herd and broke into a sprint, his heavy legs making the ground shake as he built up to top speed. The herd was in chaos. Some pushed each other out of the way if they were too slow, or tripped over each other in panic. Between some of the herbivores were the Dionychus, 
which now had to dodge the large bodies of the Tenotosaurus, who didn't seem afraid of them at all. With six tons of angry super predator right behind them, it wasn't hard to see why. Letting out another menacing roar, the Acrocanthosaurus was gaining on the herd, lowering its head to snap at random tails before lifting it back up to send a rippling snarl into the air. All dinosaurs were running at top speed, with the faster or healthier members outrunning their brethren. Their pursuer was not built for long distance running, but for short bursts of speed, and he was beginning to tire. Every time he tried to grab one of the herbivores, they would dart out of the way or flick their tails just out of reach. Then he saw something, an old Tenotosaurus struggling to keep up. The hunter steered himself in the old dinosaur's direction and closed in. The old female could barely keep up with the herd, and with the Acrocanthosaurus going straight for her, the rest of the Tenotosaurus moved out of the way. Now right behind his prey, the Acrocanthosaurus didn't attack, but waited till he was right beside the struggling herbivore. He then raised his head, opened his jaws, and with bone-shattering force, smashed his head into the back of the Tenotosaurus's neck. The force of the attack slammed the victim into the ground, sending its back legs into the air and breaking its spine on impact. The lifeless body collapsing to the ground. With his target now dead, the Acrocanthosaurus threw his head into the air and swept it from side to side in one final roar filled with rage and triumph. The herd hadn't stopped running, and the roar only made them move quicker. Taking in a deep breath, the Acrocanthosaurus grabbed the corpse by the base of the tail and began the trek back to the remains of the waterhole, where he could get some shade and eat in peace. With dominance clearly established, the Tenotosaurus wouldn't be returning to drink what little water was left. The Dionychus might, but would definitely steer clear of him. This kill would keep him going for weeks, plenty of time to wait out the dry season, though he would put on hold patrolling his territory. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today we will be breaking down one of the most powerful theropods of all time, Acrocanthosaurus. Acrocanthosaurus was a large theropod dinosaur from the early Cretaceous period that lived between 113 to 110 million years ago. It reached lengths up to 11.5 meters long, stood about 4 meters tall, with a skull length of 1.3 meters. It weighed 6.2 tons, although some calculations put its upper maximum weight at 7.2 tons. Its name means high-spined lizard, referring to the high neural spines that ran along its neck, back, and most of the tail, giving it a distinct appearance. Originally, scientists believed that the spines protruded above the back freely, or were covered by a skin membrane similar to Spinosaurus. However, today it is believed that the spines held large muscles and were covered much like a bison's back. Possibly used as fat storage so that it could go for long periods of time without eating. Other theories include it using it for regulating heat or as a way to attract mates. Of course, all could be true. A male Acrocanthosaurus that has a full, strong back may not only be more appealing to the opposite sex, as it shows that he is strong and healthy, it would also be a deterrent to other males who aren't as well fed or as large. Despite its arms looking relatively small, they may have been quite strong, though they had little in the way of articulation. They couldn't even reach up to scratch its own neck, but they could be pulled backwards. This has led to the theory that Acrocanthosaurus would bite into prey and then grab it with its three clawed fingers in order to hold it securely so that it could continue to bite again and again. Since the arm contained a lot of cartilage, this would have stiffened them and made them less likely to twist or dislocate. Another theory is that they used its jaws to hold the prey and then repeatedly slashed at them with its claws. The skull was long, low and narrow and had a thick brow over the eyes. With wide teeth and its jaws being backed up by strong muscles, it would have had a powerful bite force of thousands of pounds per square inch. Being the apex predator of North America at the time, Acrocanthosaurus would have fed mostly on ornithopods, but is presumed to have gone after the armored nodosaurs that it lived with, and large sauropods, even giants like Sauroposeidon. 
In fact, footprints that are believed to be from Acrocanthosaurus have been found over the top of sauropod footprints, suggesting that the Acrocanthosaurus was pursuing or stalking a herd. Some of the species it lived alongside include Tenotosaurus, Dionychus, Astrodon, and Sauroposeidon. Acrocanthosaurus is another large predator that doesn't get a lot of attention compared to some other megatheropods. Although, it has been brought to light more recently in games such as Jurassic World 2 and Ark. To me, its unique appearance and the speculation that it was a sauropod killer is more than enough reason for it to owe its time in the You can see a life-size mounted skeleton of one at the North Caroline Museum of Natural Sciences. So, Acrocanthosaurus. A powerful and strong looking predator. One that I can easily see pulling down a sauropod using its large back muscles, punching above its weight as it were. But what do you think of Acrocanthosaurus? You gonna spread the word on how cool this one looks? Let me know what lesser known dinosaur you'd like me to cover in a future episode. And until then, thank you for watching.